Okay. Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. So thanks everybody uh, for coming to the second lecture. So I will continue uh, talking uh, about uh, certain energy and packing problems on the sphere today. And I just wanted to say that um, my lectures are going to be fairly independent. So if you missed one, I mean, they are connected, but it doesn't mean that uh, you will not be able to, to follow this one lecture if you missed the previous one. Okay, so uh, today I will mostly talk about certain minimal energy problems. And uh, yeah, I remember one particular instance that happened in this very room in the Schrodinger Institute several years ago. There was a um, conference on a similar topic and uh, Salvatore Torquata was given a talk and I remember he made this very bold statement that um, he said every a problem in discrete geometry is actually an energy minimization problem. So, and somehow, well, of course, it's probably too bold, but somehow this statement stuck with me. Okay, so, well, yesterday we talked, this is just a quick reminder, we talked about, um, uh, sev uh, about several um, particular energies on the sphere, which arise most naturally, so in particular the Reese energy or the Cologne energy. Um, yeah, and this is just a repetition of the slide from yesterday. So even on S2 for this simple formulation, if you consider this simple interaction energy given by Coulomb's law, uh, very few answers are known. Okay, today, uh, well, and this, this generalizes also. Today we'll talk about some other energies, which uh, some of them are similar, some are related, some will look differently, uh, that arise from different uh, different problems in, in different areas in discrete geometry and signal processing. Okay, so here the, all of this is just a repetition of uh, what I was talking about yesterday. So this is the Reese energy. And in particular, the cases, <clears throat> the, all the energies that I will talk about today will be more similar to uh, to the case of negative S okay, in the Reese energy, in the sense that the energies that I will talk about today um, will not have singularities. The kernels will not have singularities. So in particular, then this, whether or not you're excluding the diagonal terms will not be very, very relevant. Okay, so and we briefly talked about the case of, in particular, of S equal to negative one yesterday. That's when S is equal to negative one, you're just talking about, about the sum of distances. And this is a very common uh, topic in general, not just on the sphere, in, in metric geometry, it's a sum of distances or distance integral is a very common object. You're trying to maximize the sum of distances and intuitively it's clear that this leads to a uniform distribution of points on, well, at least on the sphere. If you maximize the sum of distances, at least you expect that uh, that points should be somehow uniformly distributed. Although already in yesterday's discussion, we saw that such intuition can actually be wrong, whereas we discussed that if you take the Reese energy with negative power smaller than negative two, so if you take a power here greater than two, then the minimal points will not be uniform or maximal points rather optimal energy points will not be uniformly distributed. They will collapse to two opposite poles. Okay. Um, another very interesting feature of this particular energy, energy on the sphere is that it's closely related to another object in uh, in point distributions and other standard objects, the so-called spherical L2 discrepancy, spherical cap L2 discrepancy. Okay, so and actually it's related to an identity, which maybe if I have time, I will mention in one of my last talks. So minimizing the spherical cap L2 spherical cap discrepancy is exactly the same as maximizing this uh, sum of distances. Okay, all right. Um, and again, I, I briefly talked yesterday about what happens if you take this uh, energy on the sphere and you replace the Euclidean distance by the geodesic distance. And we saw that in some sense things were a little similar, but then also there was an important difference. Okay, so in particular, if you just replace, if you keep the same form of the energy, so you have distance to the power one, uh, in uh, in this case, um, 
any centrally symmetric configuration is a maximizer when n is even okay so when n is even you can have central uh, centrally uh, centrally symmetric configurations it could be all points at the same uh, two opposite poles or it could be uh, points very uniformly distributed over the sphere the only condition is that the distribution should be symmetric this was initially a conjecture by Feish Todt uh, and uh, it was solved completely and again probably in the lecture on Friday I will show you one of the solutions there are several solutions and uh, it's solved on all possible levels in all in all dimensions for even values of n for odd values of n you get slightly more complicated sets you can have you, you, you would have a symmetric component and the one dimensional component living on the great circle. Um, okay, but, uh, and it's also solved for continuous versions of energies for energy integrals rather than discrete sums. So, so, for, so symmetric measures are uh, maximizers of the corresponding continuous energy. So yeah, this, this is solved on all possible levels. And as we discussed yesterday, if you start taking powers here or the geodesic distance, the power one is exactly where the phase transition happens. If the power is less than one, then your optimizers will be uniformly distributed over the sphere as n goes to infinity okay and when the power is greater than one they will collapse to two opposite poles so so here you have the a similar phase transition but it happens at power one okay all right so um this was uh, as i said originally posed by a fair thought uh, the previous problem is also pro known as the problem of fair thought and the problem that i'm about to show you to you on the next slide is also uh, posed by fair thought so fair thought uh, Laszlo Feistot posed quite a number of different problems about points on the spheres, in particular about energies uh, for points on the sphere. And to be honest, most of the problems that he posed, when he posed them, he posed them just on S2, but of course they easily translate to all dimensions. Okay, so here is yet another problem of Feistot, and uh, the problem uh, looks uh, uh looks like this so here you're considering a different energy so it's the minimum your the kernel here is the minimum between the geodesic distance and pi minus the geodesic distance so you're taking the acute angle between the lines generated by two points on the sphere so if you draw the sphere oops well let's imagine it's the sphere um so you take two points, you take lines passing through those points generated by those vectors, and you take the acute angle. Um, so in other words, here taking, uh, changing one point X to minus X doesn't do anything. So if, Maybe a more proper version of this problem would be on the projective uh, projective plane instead, but we don't want to do that because then we somehow lose the geometric uh, intuition. Um, so I'll keep this on the sphere. Okay. So if you keep it on the sphere, uh, then if you write it, if you draw this, the graph of this, for example, in terms of the angle, uh, then the graph of uh, this function looks like this. Okay, where um sorry so the, so this is the angle pi uh this is zero and here you get well depending on how you normalize your geodesic distance well let's say this pi over two okay. it looks like this um so and we see that you have a very different structure because now this is no more just repulsive so the behavior at large scales replica replicates the behavior at small scales and uh, if you just consider two points two particles they want to be orthogonal so this is well here we're maximizing this sum so the maximum happens when the two points are orthogonal 
So this tells you that maybe you would be expecting something that preserves some amount of orthogonality as uh, optimizers of this energy. Okay, and indeed the conjecture of fish thought for this problem is that uh, the um, maximizers of this energy are periodically repeated copies of an orthonormal basis. Okay, so you take, for example, if you're on S2, you take, let's say this is E1, E2, E3, and you just keep going to take E1, E2, E3, E1, E2, E3, and so on. Okay, so you keep repeating the same orthonormal basis. So this is this is the conjecture. Uh, so Page thought posed it and he solved it on S2 for small values of n, and I think that's still the largest that is known. Uh, it is completely solved on S1. Um, it's uh, there are several different solutions on S1 and uh, on S2 and in higher dimensions it's still open there are some partial results but it's completely open even in higher dimensions it's even open for small values of n uh, in uh, it's open for example even when n is a multiple of the dimension you would think that maybe it's easier when n is a multiple of the dimension because at least you get several complete copies of this orthonormal basis but still it's uh, it's still open okay however however there are some versions of this uh, problem that are solved so some modifications of the problem which also give you some intuition about why this may be true and Hopefully, maybe it will help a uh, solution in the future. So let me state a couple modifications and uh, tell you a few words about the results and, uh, and how they are obtained. So the modifications essentially uh, concern taking this function and taking different powers, just like we did with uh, the um, uh, with the geodesic distance and the Euclidean distance like we discussed it yesterday. Okay, so if you take various positive powers of this uh, function, okay, well, at least in the case when the number of points is a multiple of the dimension, uh, if you take a power here greater than or equal than two, okay, then the conjecture holds. You get k copies of the same d-dimensional orthonormal basis as the um, maximizer of this uh, of this energy. Okay. Um, I will tell you a couple of words about the proof, but I will first need to tell you some more things. So I'll jump back to this slide a little bit later. Okay. So uh, well, at least this uh, this tells us that the con the conjecture makes some sense, has some hope, because at least we know that it holds for some. Uh, for some powers large enough. Okay, so uh, this has an interesting history. This was first proved by Lehman McCann for some alpha large enough. And then as soon as they posted their paper on the archive with uh, my collaborators, uh, Alexei Glazir and Ryan Matsky, uh, Josiah Park and Alex Lesuk, we realized that there is a very simple uh, proof based on simple linear programming of this fact, which also gives an effective bound on, uh, on alpha. Okay. Um, so, so this is one case when it's solved, but only for the case uh, when n is a multiple of the dimension. Well, if you take this modification to the extreme, then uh, you can solve this even for uh, values of n, which are not multiples of the dimension. And what do I mean by taking it to the extreme? Well, let's take this power to be infinity. Okay, so this is similar to uh, backend problem in a sense okay so um well if you if alpha is infinity this is what this function becomes right because this is normalized to be between zero and one so this becomes zero everywhere but at pi over two okay so basically what are we doing here then we're just counting the number of of orthogonalities among uh, the points in your set, right? That's all that this energy does, okay? Uh, so this is zero unless points are orthogonal, okay? So and you want to maximize this. So the question is, uh, what is the point set which, uh, uh, 
which uh, gives the uh, which gives you the maximal number of orthogonalities. So if you represent it as a graph, and where points are connected, vertices are connected if the points are orthogonal, you are counting. Uh, uh, well, you want to count the maximal number of edges, and what is the condition? Well, the condition is that you cannot have clicks of size more than d, because you're in d dimensions, you cannot have uh, more than d orthogonal vectors. Okay, well, there is a theorem in, in graph theory which uh, answers that question, what's, uh, uh, what's the... Uh, was the graph with the maximal number of edges under this condition. This is Turan's theorem, and this the graph is known as Turan's graph. And it's, I will not describe uh, the exact definition of this graph, but it's just the graph which is which gives you exactly the orthogonality graph for the periodically repeated orthonormal basis. Okay. And uh, this statement also has the, the same history as the previous one. Lehman McCann proved this statement, but by a much more uh, complicated argument. And then when the paper came out in the archive, Alexei Glazerian actually noticed that you can, you can do this using Turan's theorem in, in a few lines. Okay, so um, yeah, so it's a, I think it's a very interesting connection, and and this shows that uh, the conjecture the conjecture makes sense. Okay, because at least uh, there is this intuitive explanation to the conjecture, which comes from combinatorics from graph theory. Okay, all right. Uh, so now I will talk about yet another energy. Uh, another energy minimization problem that has a similar structure, and actually it will help help us understand the uh, the energies that I just talked about. But also, it's very important in signal processing and applied functional functional analysis and uh, a lot of other topics. Um, okay, so this. Uh, deals with the so-called frame potential. So before I uh, define the uh, frame potential, I'll tell you what frames are. So this is also the problem of so-called unit norm tight frames. Okay, since they're unit norm, they live on the sphere. This is also a problem about point distributions on the sphere. Okay, and the unit norm tight frame is a collection of points on the sphere. Uh, which uh, for which the following relation is satisfied. So an analog of Parseval's identity, only with a constant here. And it's very easy to check that if there is some constant, if it's satisfied for every vector with some constant, with some fixed constant, then that constant has to be this, okay? Um, equivalently using polarization, you can just show that it's, uh, this means that you can represent every vector just like you would do with any orthonormal basis, but again, with a constant here. Okay. So you can think of tight frames as over complete orthonormal basis if you've never seen them before. And actually the first example, if you want to ask yourself, do they even exist? The first example is of course, take um, two or more copies of, of an orthonormal basis. You can either take the same orthonormal basis, repeating it several times, just like we did in phase dot conjecture. You can take different orthonormal bases and concatenate them. That would give you uh, UNTFs. Um, and actually that explains this constant very well why the constant should be n, n over d. That's if you do that, uh, if you take several orthonormal bases, well, this exactly tells you how many bases you've taken. Okay, well, if th those were the only examples, of course, this wouldn't be interesting. There are many more other interesting examples. In particular, there are examples where points are very nicely and uniformly distributed over the sphere. And uh, this uh, plays, uh, plays an important role in, um, in particular in signal processing. So. Over complete basis, so this unit norm time frames, they allow for a certain loss in information uh, because you're taking more measurements uh, than needed in a sense. Okay, well, how is it related to energy? Well, uh, there is a, a result of uh, Benedetta and Ficus from a few years ago, well, about 50, well, well, about, yeah, that's a lot of years ago by now. <laughs> um, uh, well, which says that. Uh, if you consider this energy, okay, so here you're taking the inner product between the vectors squared, 
okay, or absolute value squared, because you can actually do the same thing in the complex case also. And that's also very interesting and sometimes more interesting than the real case. In the real case, of course, you don't need these absolute values. Okay, but what they have proved is that it's any local minimizer of this energy, which they call the frame potential, okay, is a is a unit norm tight frame. Okay. Uh, so, so this is an if and only if statement. Some parts of it are actually pretty easy. I'll show you part of the proof of the next slide. Okay, but uh, some parts require a little bit more work. So let me actually show you the simple part of this statement. So I will just do the computations. Well, I have written out. We'll go. We'll go through it. So let's look. Let's take an arbitrary set of points on the sphere. And by the way, I use different notations for inner products interchangeably. Okay. So let's compute this energy. I normalize it just. I'm more used to normalizing it. So never mind. I just divide it by one over n squared. Um, OK, then just expand the square. OK. And if you now interchange these sums and put the like terms together, uh, so I will take this terms zi's together and zj's together. Okay, so then the sum inside, well, it breaks into a product. This sum here, when I put it inside, it would break into a product of two identical sums like this. Right? Okay, so I just get a square of this sum. Okay, so basically what I did is I put the square, I first expanded the square and then I put it onto a different sum. Okay, all right. So now start estimating. So here in this inequality, I'm just dropping all of the uh, off diagonal terms. Okay, I'm only keeping the diagonal terms here. Right, And in the second inequality, well, I want to put this sum inside the square. And so I will use Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and I have to pay a price of one over D when I use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality because there are D terms in the sum. Okay. Here, so this is Cauchy-Schwarz. Okay, so, and then, things become very simple because I can take this sum and put this inside. Okay, and then I just sum the coordinates squared of each point and they live on the sphere. That's one. I have n terms here, so I'll get n squared, which will cancel out with this n squared, so I get one over d. Okay, so I got a lower bound for the energy. <clears throat> I got a minimal value uh, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the energy. And um, we can see when, when this is attained. Okay, it is attained when all the diagonal terms are equal to zero. Okay. And when the all when all of the sorry, off diagonal terms are equal to zero and all the diagonal terms are, are equal to each other, because we use Cauchy Schwartz here. Okay. Uh, well, what does it mean? It means that if you take the matrix. If you take, well, essentially take zi times zi transpose, okay, that is a multiple of the identity. Okay, all the off diagonal terms are zero, and the diagonal terms are all the same. But that's exactly the frame condition because let's go back here. You could take this identity here, and if you write it in the matrix form, this will tell you that the sum of um, ZK times, the tra times its transpose is a multiple of the identities. So it will be N over D times identity. So it's a more compact form to write the fact that the set of vectors is a tight frame. All right. Okay. So, so the equality is attained if 
Z is a unit norm tight frame. Okay. Well, notice that this doesn't yet tell you that the equanimity can be attained because we technically do not know that they exist for every n. So, and this is uh, this is the somewhat harder part of the result of Benedetta and Ficus. So they actually they they prove that any minimum, even the local minimum, when it's attained, it has to be unit norm tight frame, and then. This computation tells you that it has to give you the minimal energy. Actually, that also reveals an interesting fact about this energy that it doesn't have local minima which are not global. Every local minimum here is a global minimum. Okay. All right. Um, well, now I promised you that I I would use this to uh, to explain. Uh, the proof of this result. Okay, so an easy proof of this result is the following. You can take the function 2 over pi, and now if I express it in terms of the inner product, so if t is the inner product, x dot y, so this will be the arc cosine of uh, t. It's, I'm taking the um, arc cosine of absolute value of t. Okay. Right, because I'm taking I'm taking the acute angle, so I need an absolute value here, okay, and I put it to the power alpha. Well, you can check that this will be bounded uh, below by one minus uh, t squared or above, rather. And uh, you can, this is not true for powers less than two, but it's true for power two. Okay. And uh, well, T squared is exactly the kernel from the frame energy. Okay. So for frame energy, we know how to, how to minimize it. Okay, so, and this here we have minus T squared, so we're maximizing. So we know when this is maximized, it's maximized when the configuration is a tight frame. Okay. Well, but here we also we want to have an equality here to make sure that we also that this also maximizes the energy with this kernel. And the equality, these two functions would only touch each other. Oh well, okay, that's not here. This is sorry, this is written in terms of um in this is in terms of the angle, so it's not it's not a good picture. But anyways, um Mm -hmm. The equality would only happen when points either coincide, are opposite, or orthogonal at t equal to zero or plus minus one. Okay, and that tells you that among all tight frames, you can only take orthonormal basis. Okay, so so this this gives a proof, and actually this uh, is a a very simple application of the linear programming method, which we will talk about probably tomorrow. Okay more detail okay all right so so frame energy helps understand something about the fair thought problem also okay so now let's uh, use frame energy to understand some other things some other uh, geometric uh, properties of frames and geometric properties of uh, points on the sphere. So the next thing I want to uh, mention is the so-called uh, Welch bound. Okay, so we will, this This is essentially a packing problem. Okay, so let's uh, introduce the following parameter for a set of points on the sphere. We'll look at the maximal absolute value of the inner product. Okay, so this, uh, Again, if we translate everything to the projective uh, to the projective space, this is the minimal separation between your set of points, right? Uh, uh, this corresponds to the minimal separation. Uh, of course, on the sphere, it's not quite the minimal separation because here, change in zi to minus zi doesn't change anything. But uh, again, I'll still keep things on the sphere for uh, for simplicity. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then there is an Really simple bound uh, for for this separation parameter. Okay, that uh, for a set of n points, it has to be at least as big as this. It cannot be too small. 
and uh, the proof one of one of the proofs at least goes through the uh, through the frame energy essentially. So if we write down uh, the the frame energy that we just computed. On one hand, we know the lower bound, it's one over D, okay? On the other hand, we can say that we first have the diagonal terms, and there are N of those and they give you one, and then you have the off diagonal terms, and there are N times N minus one of those, okay. and they are all bounded by gamma squared right and now i will not do the algebra in order not to embarrass myself but if you if you simply take this inequality and solve it for gamma you will get exactly the welsh bound from here okay. so this this comes this essentially comes from the um from the energy from this energy bound and i think that's actually how Welch proved uh, this inequality originally. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so you have this separation bound. And again, let's try to understand when equality happens. Okay. So, first of all, we would need uh, to have equality here. And here, equality happens if Z is a unit norm tight frame. We already figured it out on the previous slide. Right? And we would also need an equality here. And here, the equality happens if all of the off diagonal terms have the same value of the inner product. So, um, Zi dot zj absolute value of this is constant okay. so these objects which satisfy these two properties are known as etfs so this stands for equiangular tight frames So here, our first condition says that it's a tight frame. The second condition says that this, the lines generated by these uh, vectors are equiangular. Okay. And let's talk in a little bit more detail about equiangular lines, because it's also a very interesting problem, also about points on the sphere, essentially. So, so we will say that a set of points on the sphere is equiangular or generates equiangular lines if Whenever i is not equal to j, the inner product is some constant value alpha. Okay. And we already know that if you have n points from the Welch bound, you know that alpha has to be at least this big. Okay. Well, uh, you, if you want, so to say, the best packing, you want uh, you want to make alpha as small as possible. So you want to understand what happens. Can you make alpha equal to this parameter? Okay. And more generally, you want to understand for which parameters. So you have three involved parameters here, n, alpha, and d, the dimension. For which parameters do such objects exist? And uh, what's, uh, what's, what are the maximal possible objects that, uh, that can uh, arise this way? Okay, so, uh, well, we'll try to figure out a few things related to, to this problem. This is actually a very, very popular area with lots and lots of different results. Of course, I will not survey all of them. I just want to give a brief introduction to this, to this interesting topic. Okay, so let me state one lemma, which will help us understand what's the maximal number of equiangular lines that you can put uh, in a given dimension. Okay, so... The lemma is the following. If you take, um, if you take a set of equiangular lines, uh, then if you consider these matrices, okay, these matrices are linearly independent. Okay. 
Okay. And the proof is, uh, is quite simple. So let's assume that Let's assume that uh, we have a linear combination which equals zero. Okay, and let's uh, uh, well let's look at it as a bilinear form and let's apply it to one of the vectors z j in your collection. So basically, I act by the vector z j on the left and on the right. Okay, if I do that, I will get the equation. I will get exactly zi zj inner product squared equals zero and i get it for all j from one to n i'll get one inner product when i act on the right one inner product when i act on the, on the left okay um all right so, well this simply tells you that you have some over i not equal to j since this is equiangular we have alpha times alpha squared uh, sorry times uh, lambda i and then plus lambda j and that equals zero and again for all j from one to n well it's very easy to solve this system uh, you can first easily see that all the lambdas have to be the same and that implies that uh, they have to be zero so the solution of this is that all the lambdas are zero so this system is linearly independent okay so so this is simple okay well if it's linearly independent then uh well these are uh, these are D by D matrices, right? So the total number of these matrices cannot exceed the dimension. So in particular, it cannot exceed D squared, okay? And in, com in the complex case, uh, that's, that's the bound that you get. In the real case, you can do better. A symmetric matrices in the real case form a linear subspace, and uh, this is the dimension of the... Uh, space of symmetric matrices okay so so you have this bound on the number of the on the cardinality of the largest equiangular set in d dimensions in the real case and in the complex case okay okay also an interesting observation here which brings us back to the uh, original considerations about uh, tight frames is that if if you have a, an equiangular set, which is maximal in this sense, which achieves this bound, then it has to be a unit norm tight frame. Okay. And the proof is very similar to what we just did, because if it achieves this bound, then you can use these matrices, ZI, ZI transpose, uh, to, to obtain inf the identity matrix. Okay, with some coefficients here, lambda. But then you take this system and you solve it just the same way as we did before, and you figure out that all the lambda i's have to be the same. Okay. okay. And that gives you the frame condition, the tight frame condition. Okay. That the sum of uh, the i, the i transpose is a multiple of the identity. Okay. So, so this is a very simple observation. So if you have, if you have a maximal, maximal possible equiangular set, it has to be a tight frame. Okay. Well, since it has to be a tight frame, uh, then uh, the identity in the Welch bound is achieved. Okay. And the separation parameter, the, 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 this equal angle that you get, the, the parameter alpha could be easily computed from, from the Welch bound, from this, the right-hand side of the Welch bound. And it's equal to one over uh, square root of one over d plus one in the complex case and one over d plus two in the uh, real case, okay? All right, so, but then the question is, okay, we know these, bounds okay 
can they be achieved? Do we know when they can be achieved? Uh, and uh, what's uh, are there any other restrictions other than other than this uh, uh, than this bound? Well, in the real case, there is one additional restriction that's sort of number theoretic in nature. So, and I will I want to go over this restriction. So here is the theorem. I think it's due to, if I'm not mistaken, to Neumann. So if you have an any equiangular set in in the real case in RD, uh, where the number of points is more than twice the dimension, okay. um, then uh, um, oh by the way, actually let me go back for a moment. Uh, let's have some examples where this uh, where this is achieved. So for example, in R two. Uh, you can just take the the simplex, the what's often in this theory called the Mercedes-Benz logo sign. Okay. Right, and this, and then this this has three in R two. Your bound is three, right? And you get one over square square root of three for alpha, exactly, right? And in R three. You can also achieve this bound. Uh, you can take the ecosahedron. So in R3, you would get uh, 3 times 4 over 2, that's 6. So you take uh, the representatives uh, of the ecosahedron test 12 vertices, but they're symmetric. You just take one representative from each pair. OK, so this is the ecosahedron. Uh, right. and. And sorry, by the way, I was wrong. In R two, we get one one half. In R two, I, I, in R two, in R two, we get one half here, and in R three, we get one over square root of five. That's exactly the angle in the icosahedron. Okay. All right. So, so we have examples in R two and R three. So let's see what happens beyond. Okay. So here's the theorem again. So if you have an equiangular set of points with uh, uh, whose cardinality is greater than twice the dimension, then one over alpha, where alpha is the angular parameter, uh, has to be an odd integer. I'll give a proof of this statement, I'll at least part of it. I'll show that it has to be an integer. There is an extra step to show that it has to be odd. OK, so, uh, so let's do uh, the following. So let's look at the gram matrix. OK, so the gram matrix is. Uh, it has rank at most D. So the dimension of the kernel is uh, at least N minus D, right? Okay, so zero is an eigenvalue with multiplicity at least N minus D, okay? So then I do the following. I subtract the identity that kills the ones on the diagonal, and I multiply it by one over alpha, okay? Well, since everything here, and we're in the real case, everything here was plus or minus alpha. Now everything here is plus or minus one. Okay, so this is an integer matrix. Okay, and we know that uh, now uh, negative one over alpha is an eigenvalue with multiplicity at least n minus d. Right, but the characteristic polynomial of this matrix is has integer coefficients. Okay, so all the conjugates of alpha, uh, all the algebraic conjugates should also be roots with the same multiplicity. Should also be eigenvalues with the same multiplicity. But now this con uh, this condition kicks in. Okay, so n minus d is uh, at least. Uh, n over 2. Okay. So it's actually strictly greater than n over 2. So you cannot have other roots with the same multiplicity, which implies that 1 over alpha is rational. But also, the characteristic polynomial is a monic polynomial with uh, integer coefficients. 
So then it's very simple. If it, if it has an irrational root, that root has to be integer. Okay. So this implies that one over alpha is an integer. Well, an alpha is positive, so it's a natural number. Okay. Well, there is a li little bit of extra work involved. You you tweak this matrix a little bit further with a, with a similar similar tricks to show that uh, uh, that you actually have uh, that yeah. Yeah. Just uh, can you repeat why one by alpha is rational? Why it's rational? Okay. Because uh, okay, you have an in the polynomial with integer coefficients. Uh, so if alpha is a root, uh, then all the algebraic conjugates of alpha also have to be roots, okay, uh, with the same multiplicity, okay. But we have this condition, okay, and this means that the multiplicity is at least n minus d, n minus d is greater than n over 2, okay. You cannot have other, so it's the multiplicity of this, and so this is an n by n matrix. Okay, so you have n eigenvalues. Okay, so this already takes more than half of possible eigenvalues. You cannot have you cannot have the same amount of eigenvalues. So that there are no conjugates, which means it's rational. Well, very good. Okay. okay thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, to prove that, as I said, to prove that one over alpha is uh, is actually a an odd number is almost almost the same. Um, so just just a little bit more trickery. Basically, you need what you need to do is you need to change this plus minus ones into zeros and twos. Okay, and they do a similar transformation. Okay, so together with this fact, you have the following theorem, uh, especially due to Gerson, that if there exists a real equiangular tight frame which achieves the which has the maximal possible cardinality okay then the dimension is either two either or three and we had examples already or it's an odd square of an odd integer minus two okay and basically the the, the proof is that well on one hand one over alpha is square root of d plus two, which we have figured out before. And the previous theorem of Neumann implies that one over alpha has to be equal, has to be an odd number. Okay. So that's it. So, so that's, uh, well, unfortunately, that's not really it. That's also not the only assumption, uh, the, the, only, uh, the only restriction. So it is known that uh, if you take, uh, what if the dimension is seven, then 20 and 23, then uh, maximal ETFs exist? Well, uh, it is also known that the maximal ETF in the, in the maximal equiangular set in dimension 47 is as cardinality is strictly less than 47 times 48 over two. Okay. So this is not achieved in dimension 47. And I, as far as I know, beyond 47, nothing is known to the best of my knowledge. Okay. So I think this is due to it's Machev. Uh, it's in the eighties sometimes. Right. Well, however, this restriction here, it does not exist in uh, the complex case. And in the complex case, this is a very famous conjecture. It is conjectured that such maximal equiangular tight frames exist uh, in all dimensions, cardinality d squared. They have a special name, which uh, is not nice to pronounce. It's called sig povns. And that stands for uh, symmetric, informationally complete, positive operator valued measures. And uh, they, this way they arise in quantum theory. And a lot of, liter of the literature on this subject would use this name. Okay. And uh, here the answers are known 
and I will not try to list all the dimensions, but in a large list of low dimensions, so I think all dimensions up to, let me see, I had it written down somewhere, up to 13, and then some standalone dimensions like 15, 19, 24, 35, um, and there is numerical evidence uh, going up to pretty high dimensions uh, with, with good accuracy that uh, the conjecture is true, but still uh, in, in full generality, it's wide open. Okay. And uh, just to, um, uh, just to finish this discussion, I want to mention one more thing, how this, these objects relate to energy, maximal ETFs in the real case and uh, the sick poems or maximal ETFs in the complex case. Uh, basically, well, the condition that uh, tight frames minimize the frame energy could be reformulated and by saying that the tight frames are almost two designs. So they... Um, or again, if you pass to the projective space, they are projective one designs. So, or in on the sphere, they are up to symmetrization. They are uh, uh, they are two designs. Um, so, if you add this extra condition that you have an ETF which is maximal, then one can show that these objects have to be up to symmetrization for designs, or in the projective sense, two designs. I do not want to introduce the uh, definition right now, but what it means in terms of the energy is that they would be minimizers. Uh, and by the way, sorry, let me erase this because it, this way it seems that it's known. No, this is not known. So it's only known in, in um, at, at most a couple dozen dimensions. Okay. So, um, so sig palms or maximal ETFs and by the way when I say maximal ETF I mean really mean the ETFs that achieve this bound not just the maximal possible in a given dimension I mean the ones that that achieve this bound okay so uh they will be minimizers of the an, an analog of the frame energy, which um, has power four here instead of two. So, um, and actually they will also be minimizers of uh, the, of this energy with all of those powers between two and four, okay. But uh, power four in particular, this, this just follows from the fact that they are up to symmetrization four designs or projective two designs. So power four is particularly simple in this case. Uh, and uh, so this relates this topic back to the energy minimization in the sphere. And as far as I know, this is one of the important and useful methods in the numerical investigations related to sick poems is uh, that search and one of the ways to search for them is to min try to minimize this energy. Okay. All right, uh, so, and I will stop here. So thank you very much. Uh, and I will see you.